All right, so let's get started here. Uh, I'm Sanjay Joshi. Uh, I've been in this hobby for almost 32, 33 years. So I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, just to, this is my tank currently. I just took this video two days before, so this is pretty much how my tank looked when I left. Right? I hope it looks the same way when I go back. <laughs> uh, so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about managing nitrates. So all of us here probably have a reef aquarium. That's why you're here, right? And if you've been keeping reef aquariums, there is one thing that you're gonna constantly battle is maintaining levels of nutrients, right? And one of the nutrients that we constantly struggle with is nitrates, right? So we'll talk about nitrates and how do you manage nitrates in a reef aquarium. Well, before we get to there, you know, not, what are nitrates? Nitrates are essentially anything that involves nitrogen, right? So nitrogen is a critical source or, for all proteins. They all need nitrogen. You cannot have life without nitrogen, right? So all the biochemical processes that are essential for life require nitrogen. And the source for nitrogen in an aquarium is going to come from different sources. It comes from ammonia, it's going to come from the ammonium ions, it's going to come from nitrite, and finally nitrates. Right? So there are different places where a coral can pull nitrogen to get the nitrogen that it needs. Right? Um, so this is what we're trying to really manage. And usually what happens with this is that the end result of nitrification is formation of nitrates, right? So that's the NO3. And that's usually what we end up measuring in our tanks, right? So no matter what you do with a reef tank, if your reef tank is established, it's going to always go through this nitrogen cycle, right? And the nitrogen cycle involves taking nitrogen from some source. It could be food, could be the atmosphere, right? Um, and that gets converted to ammonia first, right? That ammonia then gets transferred into nitrates, nitrites. And nitrites get transformed into nitrates, right? So that whole process is being executed by bacteria in your tank, right? So they're called the nitrifying bacteria. And the role of the nitrifying bacteria is to essentially convert all other forms of nitrogen into nitrates, right? And then nitrates will build up in your aquarium because that's, that's the end result of nitrification, right? And most of the times we find that the nitrate levels will start creeping up in your aquarium, right? And we struggle with trying to go the reverse way and trying to reduce these nitrate levels, right? So that process is what's called denitrification, right? And again, there's bacteria in your tank that will do some of that processing, right? So the bacteria will do the reverse. They'll take the nitrates and convert them back into nitrogen gas, right? So that's the denitrification process. And most established tanks have both going on at the same time, right? But usually, the nitrification happens at a much faster rate, and we always end up with buildup of nitrates, right? And we've been blaming nitrates for a lot of things in our aquarium, right? The health of your corals, people directly correlate to nitrate levels. Algae growth in your aquarium can be correlated to nitrate levels, right? So. As a reef aquarist, you will always find yourself be in a situation where at some point or the other, you have to manage the nitrate levels, right? So before we go any further, right? I'm, I've been talking about nitrate levels in a tank. So that means there must be some range or some target that we are shooting for 
when we want to manage the nitrates, right? And generally, people have found that if your nitrate levels are between 5 and 10, then that's a good range for the nitrates, right? But in reality, if you look at the ocean, the ocean nitrate levels are like 0.1. They're way lower than what we typically advocate maintaining in our reef aquariums, right? Um, so we often talk about maintaining nitrates and phosphates. The same thing with phosphates. I mean, generally 0.03 to 0.08 is considered a good range, right? And in the past, that's what we've been using as a recommendation, right? So more recently, people have been talking about this red field ratio, right? So Redfield was a scientist who did a lot of research back in the 1950s or even earlier, where he measured the nitrates and phosphates. What? He measured nitrogen and phosphorus in phytoplankton and in the waters where the phytoplanktons are growing, surface waters. And he found that no matter where he made those measurements, whichever part of the world he made those measurements, the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus was roughly in the range of 16 to 1, all right? So the reef hobby has jumped onto that idea and said, you know, that's what we should do. We should be maintaining our nitrates and phosphates according to the Redfields ratio, right? Well, what they failed to realize is that the Redfield ratio deals with nitrogen and phosphorus, not nitrates and phosphates, okay? So if you were to do the conversion of the nitrogen to nitrates and the phosphorus to phosphate and look at that ratio, that ratio is about 10 to 1, right? So if you follow some of the more advanced advocates of nitrates, they're all pushing for, oh, you should be going for 10 to 1 ratio, right? There are others who swear by a ratio of 100 to 1, all right? So there's a lot of people who say a successful tank, you need to have a phosphate to nitrate ratio of 100 to 1, all right? So what that means is if my phosphate was 0 0.03, then my nitrate should be around 3, okay? Uh, which generally goes on the lower end of what we recommend, all right? If your phosphates are around one, then your nitrate should be 100, right? Which is ridiculous, right? And nobody's gonna run their tanks at nitrate levels of 100. But many people run their tanks at phosphate levels close to one, right? So I don't care about the ratios. I have run my tank all the way up to nitrates beyond 150, right? And I've run my phosphate all the way up to two, right? For a short time, I would say there's no issues with that. But if you're going to run that at those high levels for several years, I guarantee you, you'll have problems with coral growth, right? And more recent research papers have shown that high levels of nitrate, they affect calcification of corals. So if you're keeping SPS, it's to your advantage to keep the nitrates lower, okay? So I, I kind of don't worry about the ratios. I go, ah, these numbers 5 to 10 and 0.3 to 0.08 have worked very well for most of us, okay? So I kind of just use those ratio numbers and I forget the ratios, right? So the next question is, well, how do I measure these nitrates, right? So you can go buy yourself a test kit, right? And these test kits, are designed to measure the level of nitrates, typically in parts per million, right? That's what we're measuring them in. Um, if you've used the standard Salifert test, which I've used for a long time, I personally have a very hard time reading that scale, right? And especially given that scale is not evenly chunked, right? It goes from, 0 to 2, 2 to 5, 5 to 20, 10, and then 20 to 50, and 50 to 100, right? The reason my tank ran at 100 is because I couldn't tell the difference between the colors, 
right? So it slowly kept creeping up. So I, I now use the nitrate uh, test kit that's digital, gives me a digital reading. Again, they all have issues with accuracy, but it's not that far off, all right? And I don't have to sit and interpret those colors, right? Uh, so when I first got that checker, I ran my tank water through it and the 75 was blinking, right? So that meant it's above 75. So I said, that's all right. I'm going to go ahead and dilute it by half and take the measurements. Still blinking. At that point, I said, now nah, this is over 150. These have gone way too high. And I said, I really have to do something now to bring these levels down, right? Now, one of the things I've learned over the years is you never want to bring anything down quickly, right? You have to do it slowly. Right? It took two years to get there. You can't bring it down in, in a week, right? Wow. So what I'm going to do the rest of the talk is essentially talk about different methods you can use to bring down the nitrates, right? And the, so this is currently what my tank looks like when it comes to nitrates and phosphates, right? So if you can see from this chart, all the way since October, the nitrates have been running below four, okay? At times they've gone almost close to zero even, right? And the phosphate, I managed to keep it below one, below 0.15, right? So this is what we've been doing over the last six months, right? A year ago, they were off the charts on all the scale, right? So you can start looking at, okay, where do these nitrates come from into my tank? What's the source of nitrates? If I'm gonna manage nitrates, I need to know where it's coming from, right? And it basically can come in from three different places. It's gonna come in from your incoming water source. If you're not using RO water, using tap water, you could be high in nitrates. Your RO is not functioning well, it could be putting out a lot of nitrates into their water too, right? So the incoming water source is going to play a role. Secondly, food. Food is a big, big source of nitrates, right? Um, so one of the things that people like to do is not keep enough fish. <laughs> so they don't have to feed as much. Or they'll keep fish, but not feed them enough. Their, their fish are skinny and thin and not in the best of health, right? So people like me who like to keep a lot of fish, my big tank has 70 fish in it, right? 500 gallons, 70 fish. Although they're small fish, I don't like big fish, but still I'm feeding a lot. So that, for me, that's my biggest input of nitrates, right? And lastly, anything that dies in your tank and you don't get it out, it's gonna decompose. And decomposition means it's gonna release all the nitrates that was holding in his body back into the water, right? So that's the other source of nitrates, right? And this will go through the cycle of ammonia first and you know, the whole denitrification cycle is going to happen, right? So if I want to manage nitrates, I need to look at input, and then look at some of the methods that will handle it, right? So the easiest way to deal with nit reducing the nitrate levels is to do a water change, okay? But when you have a 500 gallon tank and your nitrates are at 150 and you want them around five, right? If I did a 50% water change, which is 250 gallons, it would only knock it down to 75, right? So to be effective with water changes on a big tank, you can't do large water changes, right? It's too expensive, it's not easy to do. On smaller tanks, that's the easiest method, right? If you have a 10 gallon tank or a 20 gallon tank, doing a 50% water change is really easy, okay? So you could do water changes, reduce the input, which is reducing food, and then you end up with skinny fish, right? Or the next option is look at some strategies 
to pull the nitrate out of the system, right? So reducing input is easy, yeah, we can deal with that. Feeding, it's kind of interesting when you look at feeding and how much impact feeding has on the nitrate levels, right? If you ever look at the label on your food container, right? So this is the label on the container of food I was using. You'll see a number there for the crude proteins, right? The proteins essentially contain nitrogen. That nitrogen is going to get converted to nitrates eventually, right? Either it goes through the fish and comes out, right? Or it decomposes or whatever. The nitrogen is going to get released, right? So this food has roughly 49% protein, right? According to the researchers that have studied food and you know the, the ratio of nitrogen and protein and so on, it's roughly 60% of the protein is nitrogen, right? So if I look at what I'm feeding my tank, one feeding, there's a container on top, that's the amount of food roughly that I throw into my tank at one feeding, right? And that one feeding is adding 0.56 parts per million nitrates. I feed three, four times a day, right? So I'm throwing in food and I'm adding in at least one to two parts per million of nitrogen or nitrates every day, right? So if I want to keep things in balance, I have to have some way of removing that nitrate that I put in, right? And being able to lower the excess nitrate that is there. So if we look at the strategies that exist for removing nitrates, one, we talked about the easiest strategy is dilution, which is essentially water change. The other methods rely on bacteria-driven nitrification or denitrification, all right? For denitrification to take place, we don't want oxygen around, all right? So that happens only in areas in your tank where the oxygen levels are low. Right? It's called anoxic denitrification. Anoxic means not in the presence of oxygen. Right? The other way of reducing nitrates is by heterotrophic denitrification, which is not driven by the lack of oxygen, but it's driven by carbon. All right? So all of these methods are going to rely on some form of carbon source to do the denitrification, right? And a lot of methods that we use with the hobby today, right? If I want to create anoxic areas in my tank, I can use deep sand beds. Most people run bare bottom tanks. So they don't have this area where anox this uh, anoxic denitrification can take place. So they have to create ways in which we can do it with the heterotrophic methods, right? So, you can run a nitrate reactor. You can do some carbon dosing as your source of carbon. You can use bio beads, and I'll get into more details about those, right? The other removal strategy is by assimilating the nitrates into something, right? And in this case, we're gonna use photosynthesis to help us assimilate the nitrates into algae. Right? So a lot of people will focus on using algae scrubbers or methods using algae to assimilate the nitrates into the algae and then you throw out the algae and that way you have reduced the nitrates in your system. Right? Another method is to go with a whole different family of bacteria called autotrophic denitrification where the bacteria rely on sulfur to do the denitrification. Right? And finally, the last method is to find some ways in which we can chemically absorb the nitrates. Right? So, just quickly going through these different strategies, right? Dilution via water change. So, for example, if my tank was at 40 parts per million, it's a 100 gallon tank. If I do one 60% water change, my nitrate is going to drop to 16%. Okay. 
if I did a 60 gallon water change, wait, I got a typo here. Oh yeah, 320, yeah. So if I do these water changes in steps, right? If I do one single water change, I can knock it down to 16. But if I did three 20 gallon water changes, it will only knock it down to 20.8, right? And if I did six 10% water changes, six 10 gallon water changes, that would only knock it down to 23, all right? So there's a value you can see from here for doing larger water changes if you want to bring the numbers down. Successive smaller water changes often will only bring it down by a little bit. Right? Protein skimmers help, all right? And the way they help is they'll basically remove some of the organics before they break down into nitrates, all right? So the more interesting ones and are the denitrification methods, right? And they're the more popular ones. Um, so one way, like I said, of doing this is by using a deep sand bed, all right? And the deep sand bed is nice because it creates gradations in your sand bed where the oxygen levels are high on the top of the sand bed and then they dr start to decrease as you go down. And the bottom layers are the anoxic layers where the denitrification then take place and the top layers tend to be the layers where the nitrification takes place, all right? But again, it's working on bacteria. Bacteria is doing the process, right? So the more surface area you give the bacteria, the more chances they have to colonize that area and there can be more numbers of bacteria in your tank. So the design is fairly simple. Um, most people don't want a six inch or 12 inch sand bed in your, in your tank, right? So this method generally falls out of favor, but you can do it remotely, right? You can create a remote deep sand bed, right? So you can take a five gallon bucket, fill it up with sand, right? run water from the top and have it pass out from the bottom, right? And uh, a lot of people have been successful doing denitrification in this manner. That way you can still keep a bare bottom tank, but yet get the benefits of a deep sand bed, right? Uh, problems with these methods? Well, detritus is gonna get into your sand bed there. It'll get trapped in there. If you don't have enough flow, it leads to formation of uh, hydrogen sulfide, okay? So if you've ever dug into your deep sand beds and at the bottom, you get the smell of hydrogen sulfide. There's no oxygen there, so that's what happens. Right? There's a variation of that method that was created by Jobbert out in Mon Monaco Aquarium, where he came up with this idea of using plenums. All right. So you have a deep sand bed and underneath, the, so the sand bed is raised a, a little bit by an inch or so off the bottom. And now you run water from the bottom of that and have it percolate through the sand. Okay. And that prevents the formation of hydrogen sulfide. So this was a fairly popular method back when in the early 2000s, I think. Late 90s, early 2000s. A lot of the hobbies were putting in these plenums and trying to do this. Right. It's still a headache, you know. You still have to have a deep sand bed. Um, so then moving on, let's move to the bacteria that rely on carbon, all right? So these are essentially all methods that require you to add some form of carbon, right? which the bacterial population can then use to grow. And as they grow, they consume the nitrates and the phosphates. And then you either remove those bacteria by skimming or your poles eat it or something else happens to it, right? And the easiest way of dosing carbon is to use alcohol, right? So the method's the vodka dosing method, right? It's a cool method because you put a little bit of vodka in your tank, you put a little bit of vodka in you and you just keep doing that, you know? So, it's, to me, it's one of the most easiest methods to use, all right? 
Uh, so you're adding some form of organic carbon. It doesn't have to be alcohol. You can use vinegar, okay? And you can use sugars. Uh, people use glycerine as a form of carbon adding. Um, so what this does is essentially fuels the bacterial growth, which consumes the nitrogen and phosphorus, and you export this out, right? How much do you add? It's trial and error, okay? And uh, you have to be careful because if you start by adding too much carbon into the system, you might get bacterial blooms, right? So again, this method's been around, people play around with it, and there are some good guidelines out there. So I grabbed this from uh, reefkeeping.com. There was an article on there, which gives you a suggested way of doing this, right? So you're gradually ramping up the addition of carbon to your tank. Of course, all this involves testing, all right? So you keep testing. And you keep increasing the amount until the point where you start to see a drop in the nitrates, all right? And then you can either maintain that for a while and then slowly bring it down. Right? To me, this is a very convenient method. Right? I can set up a bottle of vodka, a dosing pump, right? and dose it throughout the day, slowly. What I typically do is I dilute it. That way, if something goes wrong with my dosing pump, it's not dumping the whole bottle of vodka in my tank. Right? So I usually take the amount that I want to dose in there, mix it up with three, four times the water, so it's dilute, and that way I can just dose it the whole day, right? So it's, it's there constantly. Anytime you want to add something, you're better off adding it in small increments, and dosing is the best way. And the nice thing about dosing also is that all it's gonna require me to do is increase the rate at which my pump works. I get on my app, I increase the dosage and I'm, I'm set to go, all right? So for me so far, this is my most favorite method, all right? Then there's other variations of carbon dosing, right? People have been using what's called the slow flow denitrators, which is essentially a long tube of water. You push water through it, okay? And you add a little bit of carbon, source to this and it works the same way. In the beginning of your tube, you have oxygen and you have the, the bacteria that will do the nitrification. But as you get towards the end of the tube, the oxygen is all used up and you create this anoxic region where the bacteria can strip out the, uh, separate the nitrogen from the nitrate. All right. Problems with these things as the bacteria grow in the tube, they block your tube, right? So it requires a lot more maintenance and it's hard to regulate the flow, right? Other DYI methods, you know, same idea. It's all a matter of having a media through which your water is gonna flow, flow it slowly so that as it reaches the end point, you're reaching the anoxic region and all you have is denitrifying bacteria, right? So this is an example of, I, again, found this on the internet and you can just construct your own with two tubes, right? This doesn't require the coil, right? So you don't have this problem of clogging of the coil, right? Same idea, different implementation, right? We need carbon. How can we provide this carbon source? So bio beads, is another way in which you can do that. So these are basically biodegradable polymers, mostly PLAs. You create them in pellet form and you run water through these in a reactor. The surface of these pellets has a lot of carbon, available carbon. The bacteria grow on it, right? And then you can either shake it or agitate it and slough off the bacterial film and export it out through your skimmers, right? Um, they work, okay? But managing it, controlling it is not easy. Not as easy as changing the flow rate on your dosing pump, right? So these are all these methods that rely essentially on using bacteria, right? To do the denitrification. 
So the other method I talked about was bioassimilation. Right? We want to somehow take those nitrates, assimilate that into algae, and then grow this algae and export the algae out. Right? A lot of people create refugiums and they grow the algae, but they never harvest the algae. It just, I my goodness. No, until you harvest it, that nitrogen is in your system. Right? If the algae dies, it's going to re-release that nitrogen in your system. Right? So you have to be diligent about exporting the algae. Right? Um, so the easiest idea, grow the algae somehow. All right? And then you look at ways in which we can do this and make it easy. Right? So to make it easy, people have developed different methodologies. Right? One of them is to use a reactor. So this is a Cheto reactor where they're growing Cheromorpha as the algae. Right? You grow it in a container, you run water through that container, you have light. Algae needs light to grow. Right? So you're going to have to have a source of light for photosynthesis to take place. And you can just grow the algae and then fills up your reactor. You just harvest it all out, throw it away, and then start the process all over again. Right? So that's a Cheto reactor. Uh, others use algae scrubbers. Right? The idea is the same. The, here they're drawing, growing a different kind of algae. It's not the Cheromorpha, it's not the Calurpa. Right? It's going to be whatever hairy algae that grows on these screens that you put in. All right? um, same thing. Grow the algae, remove the algae, and you've exported your nitrates. Right? Uh, this is a variation of Walter Addy's idea of having turf scrubbers. Right? Turf algae doesn't need to be submerged. It's more effective when it's not submerged. Right? So the idea with these algae turf scrubbers is you grow this turf algae, and again, you're running water over it, and it's growing and consuming the nitrates. Right? Um, so then often the question is, well, okay, you want to grow algae to export the nitrates. How much algae am I, how much nitrates am I going to remove by this method? Okay. So again, I looked in the literature to see how much nitrogen is contained in different algae? Right? Because that's what we're really going to be focusing on. So I was removing with my algae turf scrubber roughly three to four hundred grams of algae. Okay. Over a period of 20 days. Right? So I want to know how much nitrogen that algae has removed from my system. So I did some rough math. I guess it's not. It's it's good ballpark numbers, all right? So nitrogen is about three to five percent of the dry weight of the algae. So if you took all that algae and you dried it up, I did that. I put it in the oven. I did it when my wife was not there because I knew the house was going to stink, right? And uh, weighed the amount of dry algae that I got, right? And then using some of these rough ideas of how much nitrogen is in there, it's roughly three to five percent, right? So I did some of the math based on that. And in my tank, this algae scrubber was able to remove roughly 0.17 parts per million per day. Okay. So if I want to remove a lot of nitrogen every day, I would need a much bigger algae scrubber. So sizing these things can be an issue, all right? Um, but so far, all the methods I've talked about, they all work. They all work, all right? So using a different kind of bacteria now, all right? Uh, we're gonna use sulfur as the medium, all right? To reduce the nitrates to nitrogen. So there is a kind of bacteria that people found that will grow on sulfur and then uses sulfur as the energy source, right? So it takes the water, takes the sulfur, takes the nitrates and converts it to nitrogen, sulfates and hydrogen ions, right? So what this tells you right away is that if you use this method, 
all that hydrogen ions that are being added are going to reduce your pH. Because the water coming out of the sulfur, sulfur denitrators is going to be at a lower pH than what's coming in. Okay. Secondly, it's also producing sulfates. The sulfates, so your tank potentially can creep up in sulfate levels. So to counteract the pH drop, okay, people will run the water through a container of calcium carbonate. Right? Use the calcium carbonate to counteract the pH and manage that. The increase in sulfates, you can manage most of the time with water changes. Okay? But again, it's a very effective method of reducing sulfates. It doesn't sink, only if it gets to hydrogen sulfide. But generally, if you're running, if, you're, if, you're ba if your flow is correct, it's not going to stink. All right? So if you have a system where you want to use this, you know, I know Andrew Sandler uses it on his uh, big tank because he has thousands of fish in there. Okay, which Raj built that one for him, right? Very effective on his tank, right? But he found that he literally has to run his water through large amounts of calcium carbonate so the pH doesn't drop. And he's adding so much sulfate that he's having Bob Stark build him, make for him salt without sulfate, right? So your sulfate can go out of balance. Again, he's using a big tank and he's using huge volumes of this. Controlling these, the only way to control it is to reduce the amount of sulfur in there. You can't change the flow because you might end up with hydrogen sulfide. So generally, the only way to control again is to start removing the media. And again, it's trial and error, so how much and balancing it. Right? And finally, the last method of doing it is to use a resin that will absorb the nitrates, all right? So you can get synthetic media, right, that people sell, or you can walk around here and find companies that sell it. Um, that will absorb some of the nitrates, all right? Uh, but then now you need another additional reactor and so on. But some of the media you can recharge. So they are expensive media, but you can recharge them, but you know, recharging again requires more chemicals and most people start think doing the recharging, they'll do it once or twice and never do it again. <laughs> so, so those are all the methods that you can use to reduce nitrates, right? So it's up to you now, your tank, you figure out what method works best for you. All right. But what's important is that if you're a hobbyist, you better be able to control your nitrates and play with them like a yo-yo. You should be able to raise them at will. You should be able to drop them as at will. If you can do that, you'll be a successful reef hobbyist. <laughs> okay. So I only talked about reducing nitrates here. We've gotten to the point where we've beat up on nitrates so much that there are people running their tanks where there's not enough nitrate. Okay, you reach the other extreme where there's not enough nitrogen, all right? So now people are adding nitrates. And again, there are different ways of adding nitrate. It's all chemical based. All right, um, to me, the easiest way to increase nitrates is feed my fish more or add more fish, okay? And do it that way. Because one interesting thing I'm I've been reading more about nitrates and how, what corals use and so on. The corals preferentially will use ammonium before they use nitrate. Okay. Nitrate requires more energy to break that bond. Ammonium is their preferred source of nitrogen. So if you give them both, there's a researcher at Penn State who studies Suzanne Telly. And they grow zooxanthellae in wilds and containers, you know. And he said, we see this all the time. We put both ammonium and nitrates. And we start looking at how much the ammonia is dropping and nitrates are dropping. He said, in the beginning, until all the ammonia gets used up, the nitrate levels don't change. It's only after all the ammonia is gone, that's when the nitrate level starts to drop, right? So if the corals are preferentially going to use ammonia, 
then we should be looking at ways of increasing the ammonia in there, right? What's the easiest way? Put more fish and feed them, <laughs> right? So that's my, my strategy for raising stuff is to just feed my fish more and do that stuff. Um, so now I have an easy way of doing both, right? So find out which method works best for you, right? Everybody has their own style of reefing. If you're like Joe, you're the lazy ass reefer, right? And he's gonna find a method that works and vodka dosing works the best, okay? To me, that is the laziest ass method of maintaining nitrates. There's nothing to clean. There's no extra reactors. There's one dosing pump, you know, and you're gonna adjust the rates, all right? So that's kind of my talk. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, some other more research, recent research papers are showing that when the nitrate levels increase in the ocean and the temperatures increase, the calcification decreases. So that's, that's what they're finding. Because as they're doing these studies for climate change and all these temperatures going up and extra nutrients being dumped from the land, they're very interested in the impact of that. And some, there's some recent research papers that show that the the calcification rate drops with higher nitrates. Okay. Yeah. It's easy. It's, you know, they're, they're all the same methods, right? You take, you need some container to put the bio balls in and run water through it. Figure out what way works best for you, right? If you have to clean it so frequently, then the canister filter, I find it painful to open them, <laughs> right? So find methods that work best for your style of reef keeping, right? The bottom line is all these methods work, right? Yeah. I just didn't feel comfortable with nitrate levels that high. But interestingly, even at those high nitrate and phosphate levels, there's no algae in my tank, right? So when people tell me, oh, you know, I got algae problems because my nitrates are high. I go, yeah, it doesn't work that way. You can have levels high and still not have algae. And on the other side, you can have levels low and still have algae, <laughs> right? So it's not that simple. Especially when I've noticed this over time too. When you have a lot of algae growing and you measure your nitrates, they always read low because the algae sequestered those nitrates. So it always reads low. And people go, oh, my nitrates are low, but I'm growing algae. I'm like, yeah, because it's all sequestered in the algae. That's why algae filters, algae scrubbers work. But you know, if you don't take that algae out and throw it away, that nitrate is still in your system. Right? We're dealing with a closed system. You put something in, unless you take it out, it's not leaving your system. Right? Any other questions? Joe? How much vodka did you drink as you're putting it in? <laughs> No, they're all using carbon. It's the carbon that matters. Right? Give it a carbon source. Some people use vinegar, it works fine. And I buy the cheapest vodka I can find, you know, and 10, 10, 12 bucks for a one liter bottle, lasts me for a long time, you know. That's another flaky thing. It's, it's hard to pin down numbers for when cyanobacteria is going to grow, right? When all my nitrates and phosphate levels were high, 
I had no cyanobacteria, right? I showed you my numbers right now. I have cyanobacteria now. Not huge patches of it, but there's patches of it. But they were not there when the, my levels were high. So, to, to be honest, I can't tell you that, oh, you don't want cyanobacteria, these should be the numbers. Because I'm seeing it at low numbers, I never saw it at high numbers. Right? So there's always something that, in any system or any living being, there's this law of limiting resources. There's something that limits growth. It could be a trace element, right? That can limit growth. You can have as much alkalinity, nitrates, phosphates, everything, but the algae won't grow because there's something else missing, right? So you have to figure out which one might be missing. Yeah. Nobody knows the answer to that question. They can sell you bottles with all sorts of stuff, right? But there's, there's no yet, there's no definitive answer why with low nitrates phosphates I'm seeing cyano high nitrates phosphates I never saw algae or cyano right so. but the other thing to also remember is that lower nitrates will bring out better colors in your corals right because zooxanthellae you don't need that many zooxanthellae then right so the idea zooxanthellae is always brown there's no colors in zooxanthellae. It's always brown, right? And they're in your corals. If you want the colors to show, reduce the numbers of zooxanthellae. Easy way to reduce the numbers of zooxanthellae is reduce the nitrate levels. Because that's what they're going to feed on, right? And the zeovit method took that to a total extreme. And they said, just drop everything down as low as you can. Expel all the zooxanthellae and now look at your coral, corals. Oh wow, oh, look at all the colors you're seeing. Those are the colors of the coral, not the colors of zooxanthellae, right? So sometimes you'd see browning of the corals. That's essentially the zooxanthellae going crazy. They're growing like, you know, all, the environment is great for them and they're multiplying and turning your corals brown. Any more questions? I'm probably eating into Mike's time here soon. So, Again, don't get confused. This is Mike and that's Sanjay. Oh, wait, sorry, other way around. 